a great pleasure to uh, introduce our very first speaker, um, Shannon O'Donnell. And she attended medical school at McMaster, and uh, as did I. So don't ask us where the liver is or what are the three chambers of the heart, or are there four? I can't remember. Um, so uh, she started her emergency medicine residency in Toronto and finished in Alberta. And she managed to spend her fourth year in Paris doing a master's in public health. Good one. And I, she still uses that to this day, her, her French, actually. But then it says here she doesn't speak a lick of French. Um, if you're interested, uh, she, she has worked at St. Paul's for about eight years since graduating, and she loves it. And she's actually uh, married to Kevin Nemethy, so they came as a package deal. Um, and, you know, they're, they're both great physicians. And uh, Shannon's done a lot of research with, uh, with HIV, post-exposure prophylaxis, and so on. So she's a really uh, very well qualified to give this talk. And she's going to talk about an STI update. And I think she used as her subject uh, Rob Santa, who's our next speaker. So that was her end of one study. Come on up, Shannon. Oh, I forgot the little clicker. Thank you. You know, it's true what. Uh, Rob said, Brian wanted somebody who had a bit more experience, could add a bit of a personal touch to this, but Rob Sayona was hell-bent on giving the vascular access talk, so you are stuck with me. All right, so today we're going to talk about gonorrhea, uh, syphilis, and HIV, because I think there's a lot of good stuff for all three of those. Um, <clears throat> and we'll hop right in. So gonorrhea is the second most prevalent STI in Canada, and in North America, in fact. And the most common site of infection in women is the cervix. 90% um, of women who have gonorrhea in the cervix will also have it in the urethra. And the most common site of infection in men is the urethra as well. So men and women alike may present with itching or discharge or urinary symptoms, but a large number of men and the majority of women, in fact, 70% of women, will present with nothing at all. They're asymptomatic. And of course, you can get syphilis, um, anorectal syphilis, or you can get uh, pharyngeal infection as well. So these graphs are actually from the BC CDC uh, Reportable Diseases website. And they show the number of cases per 100,000 population uh, over the years. And Canada is in orange, and BC is in blue. Um, and you can see that there are approximately, in 2016, there are about 60 cases per 100,000 in both Canada and BC. And the rate has gone up a bit in Canada and down in BC. If we look specifically at Vancouver, however, we have a much higher rate of infection. In fact, we have about 150 cases per 100,000. And a lot of these cases come from the um, gay, bisexual, or men who have sex with men population. Um, and that's concerning because HIV transmission occurs more in the context of active gonorrhea infection. And so now we have this disease that is highly transmissible. In fact, associated with insertive sex, there is a 50 to 75% attack rate. Tons of people don't know they have it. Cases are going up. And gonorrhea is on the verge of becoming an untreatable superbug. So globally, there's resistance to penicillins, tetracyclines, macrolides, and fluoroquinolones. And we're really left with cephalosporins, in particular ceftriaxone. And while ceftriaxone treats about 98 or 99 percent of cases, globally there is a trend towards resistance to ceftriaxone. If we look at isolates from Canada, about 3.5 percent of the isolates have decreased susceptibility to ceftriaxone. And if we look in certain parts of Southeast Asia, more than 5% of isolates are showing resistance to ceftriaxone. And that's kind of the border for when it becomes a big public health problem. And in fact, the first strain of highly resistant gonorrhea was uh, recovered from the pharynx of a Japanese sex trade worker back in 2011. Skip ahead to 2018, and we have isolated two cases of this same strain in Canada. The first was a man in Alberta who had sexual contact with somebody from Southeast Asia. And the second was a woman from Quebec whose boyfriend had been traveling in China and Thailand and brought her back a very special souvenir. 
So the current treatment is ceftriaxone intramuscularly. In Europe, they use 500 milligrams, and here we use 250 milligrams. And we add azithromycin orally. And there's two reasons why we use azithromycin. Almost 5% of isolates are showing decreased susceptibility to azithromycin. But of course, there's usually chlamydia co-infection with gonorrhea, and azithromycin treats chlamydia. And then the second reason is that there's data from other um, pathogens where if you use a couple of different drugs that work on different molecular targets that you can decrease the resistance instead of just using one antibiotic that works on one spot. So what should we be doing? Well, we should be testing anybody who presents with any symptoms that could be gonorrhea. We also should be screening. So we should be screening high-risk um, high patients. So anybody who's young and sexually active, men who have sex with men who don't always use condoms, and travelers. Do you know that the pooled prevalence of travel-related casual sex is 20 to 34% among international travelers? So ask your patients and screen them. And the testing is really easy. The gold standard is nucleic acid amplification testing. It's almost 100% sensitive. It's, it's, it's so easy to use, and patients are okay with it because they do the screening themselves a lot of the time. So the first test, or the gold standard, is first catch urine among men, and for women, it's a self-swab of the vagina. That's as good as the physician doing an endocervical swab. So if you're doing a speculum exam for something else, go ahead and do the swab. Otherwise, the patient can do it themselves. And of course, patients can also do rectal swabs and pharyngeal swabs themselves. And then the final bit is treat. So please do make sure you get the test first, of course, because you want to be able to link back to any other sexual exposures and treat partners. But don't wait for the result. Do your treatment right away. So moving on to syphilis. <clears throat> I actually had a case of syphilis just a few weeks ago, so it was great. The CDC doc called me, and I got to ask her all my questions for this talk. Um, but it was a young guy who was from Texas, and he worked on a cruise ship, and he had been sent in by the cruise ship doc with a one-week history of fever with no source. And he looked quite well, but he did have a fever and no source. So we did an infectious workup. I added uh, HIV serology and syphilis serology, and lo and behold, he came back with a right lower lobe pneumonia. <clears throat> but we treated him for a couple days in Vancouver, and then he got back on the cruise ship. And then I got a call a couple days later from the doc at the BCCDC wondering if he had gotten back on the cruise ship. Apparently, a syphilis outbreak is a bit of a public health nightmare on a cruise ship. Um, so similar to gonorrhea, cases of syphilis are also going up in BC and in Canada. And if you look at the graph, um, per 100,000 population, Canada and BC have both had about 16 or 17 cases. Uh, if we look specifically at Vancouver, we have a much higher case rate. We have about 60 cases per 100,000. And again, when I spoke with the doc from the CDC, she was saying, you know, in Vancouver, a lot of these cases are in the MSM population. But as we move toward the interior of the province and into Alberta, most of the cases are from heterosexual sex, and this is a big problem because they're starting to see congenital syphilis. And in fact, this past summer, Alberta declared a province-wide syphilis outbreak. I don't know, is any, I know Jeff Moeller's here from Alberta, but is anybody else from Alberta? Made the trek over? Okay, so some people. Um, so remember, Canada's rate was about 16 or 17 cases per 100,000. In that same year, two years ago, Alberta had 35 cases, so more than double the national rate. And in Calgary alone, in 2018, they had 207 new cases of syphilis. And in Edmonton, they had 977 cases, so a huge increase. So, of course, we know that syphilis is contracted um, sexually if you make contact with the highly infective chancre, the primary syphilis. Um, and so you can get that through vaginal sex or anal sex or oral sex or kissing somebody. And the problem with the chancre is that it's painless. So patients may not see it. They may not feel it. Whether you treat it or not, it goes away in about three weeks. And after the body has healed the chancre, the spirochete goes and burrows into the regional lymph nodes and then disseminates, and then you have secondary syphilis. And about a quarter of those patients will develop some general symptoms, headache, malaise, sore throat, lymphadenopathy. They may have the classic rash over the trunk and the extremities and palms and soles. And then that goes away on its own, whether you treat it or not, and they have latent syphilis. And then about a quarter of those patients will go on to develop tertiary syphilis. And this takes years, 15 to 30 years, 
But the, the big systems involved are the cardiovascular system, so patients can develop aortitis and aortic insufficiency, and then they have left heart failure. It also involves the CNS system, so they can get paralysis and dementia, and then gumatous disease, so gran, or, uh, granulomas with these big necrotic centers that show up in the skin and the bones and the viscera. Testing for syphilis is really interesting. You can swab the chancres if you happen to see it, but you can also just send your serology, your syphilis serology. That's you, what you order. And the first test they do is a direct treponemal test. So in this test, they have the antigen for syphilis, for a syphilis antigen, and then they look for an antibiotic or an antibody reaction to it. And this is highly sensitive and highly specific, and it comes back as either reactive or non-reactive. And if you're positive, if you're, if you're reactive, you are reactive for life. So if it's reactive, they then go on and take the sample and do a non-treponemal test. So this is a, they give an antigen that's not specific to syphilis. So before 2014, when that was the screen, it wasn't great because if you had certain autoimmune diseases, you might react to that. Um, but the good part about this is that it gives you a quantitative value. It's reported as a titer. So it comes back as 1 and 2, or 1 to 4, 1 to 32, 1 to 64. And that is used to see where the patient is in the progression of their disease. So if you get a primary reactive test, they do the secondary non-treponemal test, and then they call the physician or the patient and get a bit more information. If the titer is low, and so the second number in the titer, I should point out, represents the number of times they dilute the patient's blood and it's still reactive to the antigen. So if they get a positive test and then the titer comes back at 1 to 4 or 1 to 2, maybe it means that that patient has had syphilis and been treated, or maybe it means that they've had syphilis, not been treated, but had it for many, many years. If it comes back at 1 in 64, like my patient, they have raging syphilis. And of course, treatment we know is uh, penicillin, long-acting. It's intramuscular. If they have early, secondary, or latent syphilis that is felt to have happened within the previous year, it's just a one-time treatment. If they have late latent or tertiary, it's three doses. And the really important thing to remember is that this has to be in the buttocks. The dose gets divided, so it's 1.2 million units, one dose in each buttock. And we've actually recently at St. Paul's had treatment failures because it was not given at the right site. So that's really important. So moving on to HIV, it's the last of the three we're going to talk about. We finally have some good news. So um, you can see that in BC and in Canada, the rates are actually coming down. <clears throat> in Canada, the rate is about 6 per 100,000 population, and in BC, we're at 4 cases per 100,000 population. And a lot of that is because of the move towards safe sex among the gay population, and also because for several years now we've had insight and safe injection sites. So we're seeing decreases among people who inject drugs. In Vancouver, our case rate is still higher, but not a lot higher. We're at about 11 cases uh, per 100,000. The good news is not across the country, however. This map is from 2016, so it's not as recent as I would like, but the numbers are pretty similar um, if you look at updated data from each province specifically. And as you can see, Manitoba and Saskatchewan have the highest rates uh, across the country. Now, Manitoba's numbers have stabilized a bit, but in 2017, Saskatchewan had 35 cases. Sorry, I'm wrong in that one. They had 15 cases per 100,000 population, so still more than double the national rate. And the demographics are really different as well. Um, across Canada, about 50% of new cases show up in the MSM population. About 35% of cases show up among people who, uh, have, who are heterosexual. But within that group, the majority have partners from countries where HIV is endemic. And then about 15% result from injection drug use. Whereas in Saskatchewan, two-thirds of the cases come from injection drug use. So it's really a very different picture. So I'm going to just talk briefly. Um, in 2017, CMATCH published the first ever Canadian guidelines for HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP, and HIV non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis. Now, PrEP is something that we as eMERGE docs should not be prescribing. They need up-to-date testing and they need very close follow-up, but it's really important that we know about it because it's here. We have lots of patients on it in Vancouver, and it's actually covered by BC, so that's great. And what it is is that patients, uh, they take one tablet a day, and that tablet is a combination of tenofovir and m Uh They take it every day, and it's recommended in the guidelines for gay, bisexual, or men who have sex with men 
who have had condomless anal sex in the last six months and also either NPEP use or an STD or high-risk behavior, so use of drugs while having sex. Um, and then it's also suggested for people who have serodiscordant partners who are either not on treatment or not virally suppressed. And it's also suggested for people who share needles. And so it's pretty effective. It's not perfect. If used properly, it's about 92% perfect, or it's 92% effective. And you have to consider that not every strain of HIV is going to be susceptible to tenofovir and tricytabine. So it's not going to be perfect, but it's pretty good. And then finally, HIV NPEP. So as I've been talking, you know, you realize all of the cases essentially of HIV transmission occur non-occupationally. So they occur through sex or sharing needles. In fact, since the last, it's in the last 25 years, there's only been one case of occupationally transmitted HIV, and that happened in 1999. Somebody who worked in an HIV lab got stuck with a needle. So while we really have to think about treating our colleagues who've had a high-risk needle stick injury, we really have to consider people who have had sexual contacts or been sharing needles. And NPEP, of course, is a 28-day treatment with three antiretroviral medications. And there are four things to consider if you're thinking about starting somebody on NPEP. The first is that it has to be within 72 hours. If it's outside of that window, don't start it. The second is that it actually has to be a body fluid that transmits HIV, so blood or semen or vaginal secretions, but not saliva. And then you have to talk with your patient and figure out what the risk that the source person, the person they had sex with or shared needles with, what's the risk that that person has transmissible HIV? And then you want to know what's the risk of the actual act, the actual encounter. So just quickly, the guidelines divide the source risk for having transmissible HIV into three categories, substantial, low, and negligible. And amongst substantial, we have HIV-positive people who are not on treatment or who are not virally suppressed. And then the second category there that you see, or the second listing there that you see, is really what I think we see the most in eMERGE. People whose HIV status is unknown, so you know who did you have sex with? And we just have to look at the demographics with our patient but are considered high risk. So these are epidemiologic groups who have higher prevalences of HIV compared with the general population. So men who have sex with men, people who inject drugs. And then you work your way down, and people who have no chance of transmis transmitting the disease or negligible chance are people who are on treatment and have been virally suppressed for six months or more and have no STI, or just somebody from the general population. And then finally, you look at the actual exposure type and what the risk is that that exposure will allow for transmission of HIV. So these numbers are in the guidelines, and they're very interesting. They come from a journal article published in the journal AIDS in 2014. And what they did is they looked at case studies and cohort studies in the pre-heart, so pre-antiretroviral era. Uh, and they come up with this summative number for each particular exposure type. And so what these numbers represent is the per act risk if you were, say, having receptive anal sex with somebody who was HIV positive and not on treatment, your risk of transmission or the risk of transmission would be 1.38%. And so receptive anal sex and needle sharing are considered high risk. Any other form of sex aside from oral sex is moderate, but oral sex is one to point out there is almost zero chance, zero percent chance of transmission. And there's no numbers there because we can't actually give a precise enough number for the risk, it's so low. And so there, they give you a two by two table and you funnel it in. So your exposure type and your source type and you can come up with whether or not you're supposed to start NPEP. You don't have to memorize this. And in fact, I don't know, does anybody use the app Spectrum, the Spectrum app? It's fantastic. It was started by Victor Leung. It's at the App Store. It's free. You can download it. It's not specific to St. Paul's. One of our ID docs started it, but a number of sites have put their data in. It's like bugs and drugs or whatever anti antibiogram that you use. Even some US sites use it. So, so do try it out. Um, but if you go here and you open it up and you go to the guidelines section, so I work for Providence. You can see it there. And then you can go to HIV NPEP. That's your next screen. And then they'll ask you to confirm was the exposure within 72 hours, yes or no. If it was, it takes you to that first screen where it takes you through the risk that the source has um, transmissible HIV. So you get to choose one of these, and then it takes you to the next page, and it goes through the exposure type and what the risk is. So you can have those numbers there to give to your patients. It's easy. It's right there. And then you click on which exposure type it was, and it gives you an answer. 
Well, I have to go back here. One sec. It gives you an answer. Initiate NPEP, consider NPEP, or NPEP not needed. And if it takes you to the initiate NPEP or consider NPEP page, it gives you all the drugs, the dosing, the investigations that you should order, and the follow-up. So try the Spectrum app. It is great. And I will get this on the BC uh, Emergency Medicine Network, I promise. And that's it. So thank you very much.